Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over the four disciplines of execution by Chris McChesney, Sean Covey, and Jim Hooling. Achieving your wildly important goals. This is an amazing leadership book and it's also just an amazing book on achieving anything in general. It's got a ton of great principles and of course the four disciplines that show you how to achieve anything that you might be setting out to achieve. Let's move into the introduction where I've pulled out a quote that I believe gives us a good overview or a good introduction into what we can expect to learn from this book. There are two principal things a leader can influence when it comes to producing results, your strategy or your plan, and your ability to execute on that strategy. Stop for a moment and ask yourself this question, which of these do leaders struggle with more? Is it creating a strategy or executing on that strategy? Every time that we post this question to leaders anywhere in the world, their answer is immediate, execution. Now, ask yourself a second question. If you have an MBA or you've taken business classes, what did you study more, execution or strategy? Once again, when we ask this question to leaders, the answer is immediate, strategy. It's perhaps not surprising that the area with which leaders struggle the most is also the one in which they have the least education. After working with thousands of leaders and teams in every kind of industry and in schools and government agencies worldwide, this is what we have learned. Once you've decided what to do, your biggest challenge is in getting people to execute it at the level of excellence that you need. The book you are reading represents the most actionable and impactful insights from all that we've learned. In it, you will discover a set of disciplines that have been embraced by thousands of leaders and hundreds of thousands of frontline workers, enabling them to produce extraordinary results. And of course, we all want extraordinary results, not just for our teams, not just in our business, not just in our job. And for me, this book is not just for leaders. I know it's certainly marketed more as a leadership book, but I want to make the case here before we get into this, that this is maybe one of the best self-leadership books of all time. After all, we all somewhat know what we want to accomplish and we have an idea for what the strategy might look like, but what do we all struggle with? It's executing on what we say we want to do. So the principles and disciplines here in this book or in this mind map, if followed, are going to lead you to have a better life in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be for leading a team. Because after all, who better to lead? The first person that we should start with leading is, of course, ourselves. This action allows us to lead others with integrity and congruence instead of top-down rules that we make up or that we read in books like this one. Having a leadership view of ourselves is a great way to progress through our lives as well. Often, we don't think about how we're actually a leader of ourselves. We often think of ourselves as just one piece. We are the person that is the doer, and we are also the person that is the decider. But that's not always the case. After all, we are generally the worst leader that we've ever actually had. I mean, if a leader in a company said some of the negative things that I say about myself to myself, I would definitely quit on the spot. And I have a feeling that a lot of you are probably the same. We deal with negative self-talk. We deal with high expectations. We deal with all of those sorts of things that truly bad bosses really exemplify. And why is this okay coming from myself or coming from ourselves, but not from what we would call an external leader? And what I'm going to invite you to do here throughout this book is cultivate an internal leader or cultivate a, a sense of being your own leader starting today. One that's following the principles we'll talk about in this book and as follows in the mind map. But first, let's think about getting aware. How does your relationship with your internal leader right, look right now? What type of leader do you want to be for yourself? Why is it important for you to lead yourself instead of leaving yourself to your natural instinct? And then after that, of course, we're going to look at execution. How are you going to help yourself and, of course, others truly get great things done? What system are you following that ensures that your goals are actually achievable? The one that we'll talk about today is probably the best in the world. One of the best leadership books of all time is certainly the one that we're reading today. I'm committing to the four disciplines, not only in my own self-leadership, but in the leadership roles that I have in my daily life through my 
business and also through this YouTube channel with my coaching clients. So before we get directly into what I, what I think is probably the biggest idea of the entire book, which is obviously the four disciplines, let's talk a little bit about mind mapping. You can get the most out of these mind maps by following along. You can find the process of how I mind map and all the mind maps available on the channel for free at the link down below. Following along with these is going to help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. And if you want to skip the line and instead of reading dozens and dozens of books or watching dozens and dozens of videos, get kind of my biggest ideas on particular topics such as mind mapping, such as learning, such as habits and goal setting, then you can get my master classes all at the mindmapguy.com. With that, let's move into our first big idea, which is actually one that I've highlighted because it's extremely important. A quick overview of the four disciplines. Although the disciplines may seem simple at first glance, they are not simplistic. They will profoundly change the way that you approach your goals. Once you adopt them, you will never lead in the same way again, whether you're a project coordinator, a lead at a small sales team, or you run a Fortune 500 company. We believe they represent a major breakthrough in how to move teams and organizations forward. And as I said, here's a quick overview of the four disciplines. Discipline number one is to focus on the wildly important. Basically, the more you try to do, the less you're actually going to accomplish. This is stark and inescapable principle that we all have to live with. The more things that we have on our mind, the more things we have on our plate, the more things that we need to accomplish in a day, the less likely we are to actually accomplish anything. Discipline number two is to act on lead measures. This is the discipline of leverage. It's based on the simple principle that not all actions are actually created equal. Some actions have more impact than others when reaching for your goal. And it is those you want to identify and act on if you actually want to reach your goal. So the idea here is to make sure that you're setting lead measures, a way to measure your progress towards your goal, and to make sure that you're acting on the ones that are the most impactful. Discipline number three is to keep a compelling scorecard. People play differently when they're keeping score. If you doubt this, watch any group of teenagers playing basketball and see how the game changes the minute the scorekeeping begins. So the idea here is to create a scorecard for yourself or for the people that you're leading that shows them how they're playing the game, shows them if they're winning or if they're falling behind, because we play differently when we're keeping score. Discipline number four is to create a cadence of accountability. And it's discipline number four where execution really happens. The first three disciplines set up the game, but until you apply discipline number four, your team isn't in the game. So you can set up, a, set up a scorecard, you can act on lead measures, and you can focus only on the wildly important. But unless you're helping your team or helping yourself stay accountable, nothing is actually going to get done. At the end of the day, the four disciplines all boil down to accountability, either to yourself, to a coach, to a leader, to a boss, to a manager. The main part here is that we need to know that we need to stay accountable. Our next big idea is WIG or WIG. The first discipline is to focus on your finest efforts on one or two goals that will make all the difference instead of giving mediocre effort to a dozen different goals. Execution starts with focus. Without it, the other three disciplines won't be able to help you. Simply put, discipline one is about applying more energy against fewer goals because when it comes to setting goals, the law of diminishing returns is as real as the law of gravity. So set fewer goals is certainly not common advice, right? Everyone talks about how important goal setting is, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we're setting only the most important possible goals. And most of us know how important goals are, but how many of them are we setting? And are we actually focusing on only the most important? That's really what discipline number one is all about. Let's focus on the wildly important goals in our lives. And they say here that we should focus only on one or two different things. They're part of what motivates us to self-actualize and become our best selves, setting goals. The sheer act of setting goals makes you more likely to accomplish your vision and be connected to your purpose. But do we know how important our goals really are? 
it's a slightly different scenario. If we set multiple goals or we set and reset goals based on our whims or our ability to actually accomplish them, how important can they really be? If we set a dozen goals, which one do we focus on? And if we reset our goals weekly, how can we really commit to actually following through? So what's the solution here? Instead of setting a bunch of goals and being willing to set and reset them, what's the solution? Well, the solution that they offer, and I think it's a very good one, is to set a small number of wildly important goals. I tend to think that two to five goals at any one time can be focused on. Obviously, here in the book, they talk about one or two very specific goals, which is, of course, another viewpoint on it. But generally, they're going to be in different areas of your life, at least for me. You're going to be looking at your fitness, you're going to be looking at your business, your relationship, and your finance. And you may kind of remove these. You may kind of reshuffle them and say, you know what, fitness is my number one goal right now, business, relationship, finance, or you might switch it up and have it in a different order as as far as importance goes. But I tend to think that two to five is a good place to stay, any more than five, and they're not really goals, they're just aspirations. But each of them should feel wildly important. And of course, that's the difference between a wildly important goal and just an aspiration. Because if they don't, you won't be willing or able to commit a high amount of energy to them. Of course, if we set a really important goal, it might be something that is going to require quite a lot of sacrifice. And if it's not wildly important, and it's just something that we kind of want or we aspire to do, how likely are we to actually go through that little bit of suffering or go through that um, need to use a bunch of energy towards the goal? Of course, we're not very likely to do that at all. Our next big idea here is whirlwind. The real enemy of execution is your day job. We call it the whirlwind. It's the massive amount of energy that's necessary just to keep your operation going on a day-to-day basis. And ironically, it's the thing that makes it so hard to execute anything. The whirlwind robs robs from you the focus required to move your team forward. Leaders seldom differentiate between the whirlwind and strategic goals because both are necessary to the survival of the organization. However, they are clearly very different. And more important, they compete relentlessly for time, resources, energy, and attention. We don't have to tell you which will usually win this fight. The whirlwind is urgent, and it acts on you and everyone, working for your every minute of every day. The goals you've set for moving forward are important, but when urgency and importance clash, urgency will win every time. Once you become aware of this struggle, you will see it playing out everywhere. In any team that is trying to execute something and even just in your own life. And the whole idea here with overcoming the whirlwind is we don't want to sacrifice the important for the urgent. This is actually coming directly from the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which, of course, Sean Covey's dad wrote. Certainly, this is easier said than done. Don't sacrifice the important for the urgent. Unless you've built a very purposeful life in business, you're likely to be spending a lot of time reacting to urgent matters. Things that need to be done at a particular time in a particular place, and sometimes that time is right now. These urgent tasks take up a lot of our time and energy, which are both, of course, the most limited resources in the entire world. And they also happen to be needed to accomplish our important goals, our wildly important goals, I should have written. Do you ever have a long day where you get a lot done, but you feel like nothing actually moved you forward towards what you want to accomplish? I can definitely put my hand up there. How do we be sure that we're spending our time on the important and actually moving ourselves forward rather than just getting the busy work done? Well, the simple answer here is to schedule time for the important before the urgent can intervene. Now, for me, this is a must. If you don't schedule your days and if I don't schedule mine, if you don't schedule time for the important, the urgent will always win. And what this looks like in my own life, for me, I've got to get, uh, I've got to get working on the important before the urgent even gets in my mind, right? I've got two different businesses, my marketing business and my coaching business, both of which take up a great deal amount of time. And a lot of it really is the whirlwind. But these YouTube videos aren't quite as urgent. However, for me and for my long-term goals, they're wildly important. 
They're the most important part. We'll talk about lead measures later, but the YouTube video, the amount of YouTube videos that I put out in a week is definitely my lead measure. That's the thing that I am focused on, number one, to reach towards my most important goals. Therefore, I need to schedule time before the urgent kicks in. So every morning at 5 a.m., I usually start working on my marketing business or my coaching business uh, a little bit later on in the day. So I try to get my YouTube part done, my videos done at around 5 a.m. I try to commit at least one hour to mind mapping, and that's very, very important. If I miss that one hour, I likely am going to miss it for the entire day. It's not likely that I'm going to be able to pick up an hour in the afternoon to get the mind mapping done. Usually it has to get done first thing in the morning. So that's kind of my way to put the important before the urgent. What's yours? How are you going to schedule time for the important so that you can kind of forgo the urgent and actually move yourself towards the wildly important goal that we talked about before? So next we're going to talk about lag measures versus lead measures, kind of what I alluded to before. Let's drill down into the distinction between lag and lead measures. A lag measure is the measurement of a result you are trying to achieve. We call them lag measures because by the time you get the data, the result has actually already happened. They are always lagging. The formula for, uh, from X to Y by when in a WIG gives us a lag measure. But WIGs, wildly important goals, are not the only lag measures in your world. The whirlwind is full of lag measures, such as revenue, accounts payable, inventory numbers, hospitalization rates, assets utilization, and so forth. Lead measures are different. They foretell the result. They have two primary characteristics. First, a lead measure is predictive, meaning that if the lead measure changes, you can predict that the lag measure will also change. Second, a lead measure is actually influenceable. It can be directly influenced by the team or by yourself. That is, the team can make a lead measure happen without a significant dependence on another team or without having to wait for the lag measure to actually happen. So how are you measuring your progress? That's really what we want to be talking about here, right? How do you know that you're moving towards your wildly important goals? Both of the measurements we talk about here, lag and lead measures, are important. Some may think of them as outcome or behavior-based goals. One leads to the other. Lead measures are called lead because they lead to the outcome that you want. And why do we so often focus on lag measures instead of lead measures? Well, it's pretty obvious that when setting goals, we generally set outcome-based goals. We set lag measures, so to speak. Those are the results that we want, and that's what we've been taught to set goals around. It's a perfect way to set big goals and set wildly important goals, because it leads to what we want. It, it gives us what we want, right? The measurement that we actually want for our goals is the outcome that happens because of all the work that we put in. Unfortunately, I think if you only set a lag measure or you only set an outcome, you're actually missing a step. After setting outcomes, we need to understand what will lead to those outcomes. And if we spend all our time focusing on the outcome, we want lag measures. Actually, we aren't going to move towards it at all. We could spend all day visualizing what our, what our lag measure or outcome is, but really that's not going to move us towards that final destination. In fact, most of the time, if we focus too much on lag measures, we actually get discouraged and we feel that we don't have the ability to accomplish them because it's very hard to measure our progress towards those lag measures, especially if we're setting super, super far out goals. So what do we do instead? Of course, we want to focus on our lead measures. So let's look at your wildly important goal. Remember, we talked about that a little bit earlier. What is your wildly important goal? Maybe we'll just pick one particular domain for right now. But next, what we want to do is dive into what behaviors you need to accomplish in order to achieve that wildly important goal. What are they? What are those things? What are the things that are going to lead towards the desired outcome that you have? And finally, you want to take those behaviors and turn them into lead measures. So that's kind of a three-step process. Let's look into this. First, for me, my wildly important goals is 1 million YouTube viewers a year, which is going to be next year, January 2021 to December 2021. I want to have a million YouTube viewers. 
So the behaviors, the things that are going to lead me to have those actual amount of viewers is I, I need to post more videos. I need to continue up with my schedule of trying to post one or two times a week. And I need to continue to promote those videos more so that they get out to more eyeballs. So my lead measures might be the number of videos posted and the number and type of promotions that I do. So I might be posting inside of Facebook groups. I might be posting two videos every single week. Those are the things that I can control. Those are the things that are going to lead towards my goal. However, if I just kind of sat back and let myself um, wish that my 1 million viewers were going to come in the next year, then of course, nothing would actually happen. I need to focus and spend some time on those lead measures. Our next big idea here is one that I highlighted again in blue for you. I think it's very, very important to keep score. The third discipline is to make sure that everyone knows the score at all times so that they can tell whether or not they are winning. This is the discipline of engagement, the discipline of engagement. Remember, people play differently when they are keeping score. The difference in performance between a team that simply understands their lead and lag measures as a concept and a team that actually knows their score is remarkable. So of course, each one of these disciplines kind of builds upon the other, right? We've got our wildly important goals first. We have to know our lag and lead measures. We have to know how to measure our progress. We've got to keep the score. And of course, each one builds upon the other. If the lead and lag measures are not captured on a visual scoreboard and updated regularly, they will disappear into the distraction of the whiteboard. Simply put, people disengage when they don't know the score. When they can see at a glance whether or not they are winning, they become profoundly engaged. So how are you keeping score and is it visible in your life? Focusing on lead measures, of course, is important. We talked about why in the point before. But to do that, we need to actually keep score, something a lot of us are simply unwilling or at least unwanting to do. Keeping score means that we are going to need to stay accountable for our actions, something that can be difficult if we're prone to being very hard on ourselves. Once you know your lead measures, you simply need to keep track. That which is measured improves, after all. Do you want to continually put two hours of deep work in each morning? Well, you need to put an X on the calendar. You need to mark it off. You need to keep the score. Do you want to continually exercise four times a week? Write that down in a notebook. Keep a journal of your exercise. That's an example of measurement. These measures are all important to make sure that we're making progress, but they do more than just that. They keep us on track and they force us to play at our highest levels. Making sure you have a cadence of tracking, accountability, and an easy scoreboard will do an amazing amount for your motivation. I tend to think that that's 80% of what getting a coach might help you with, is just having a cadence of accountability. It's very, very important. It's not easy to do on your own. Each time you have a small win, it's time to celebrate. This is coming directly from Tiny Habits, a great book on the channel by BJ Fogg, and it's one of the most important things that we can do. Make sure that we're celebrating our wins, but at the very least, make sure that we're taking a measurement of how much closer we are towards our outcome-based goal every single day. The final point here is that I don't care. Envision for yourself the day that you report the achievement of your wildly important goal to your own leaders. What would that day look like for your team, for you? And now imagine that that day never comes. Imagine you forgot everything that you've read or listened to in this video. Consider spending the future in the midst of a relentless whirlwind where everything is always urgent and the really important priorities are forever postponed. The great management scientist Peter Drucker observed, I've seen a great many people who are magnificent at getting the unimportant things done. They have an impressive record of achievement on trivial manners. But you don't want to be magnificently trivial. You want to, be, you want to make a high-level, high-impact contribution. And the four disciplines of execution can take you there. Focusing on one thing means forgetting a lot of other things, and we need to be ready for that. Focusing on high-level, high-impact goals means that you're going to need to forget about some things. Now, these things are going to be different for everyone, but sacrifice is going to be required no matter what. Maybe it's doing something like giving up your TV or your news habit. 
Maybe it's forgetting about the 12 business ideas to focus on the one that might actually be able to be successful. Maybe it's having a close circle of supportive friends rather than a large social circle. Now, like I said, it's going to be different for everyone, but to create the life you want, you need to make room. So don't focus on the unimportant. Don't focus on the magnificently trivial. Focus on the things that pertain to your wildly important goals. And of course, play all out, keep score, and avoid the whirlwind at all cost. This was The Four Disciplines of Execution. I'm reading this book as part of my Goals Masterclass. So if you're interested in skipping towards what I believe are some of the most important principles for setting goals, achieving goals, and making sure that you get the most out of this ride that we're all calling life, check out the Goals Masterclass on themindmapguy.com. Thanks for being with me, and I'll see you in the next one.